Welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Hello and welcome to another edition of Attack of Opportunity. Today we are branching out. Not an actual play podcast, not a talk show, not about RPG, but something definitely in the slightly fantasy fiction world. We are talking to J.V. Torres, published author, and has turned his book into an audiobook podcast, which we are now hosting on our network because we've gotten chummy. And uh, <laughs> he is one of our first guinea pigs where he has his own feed, he has his own podcast, he has his own set of rules, but he has shared that feed with us and we've taken it and thrown it up with all our hosts for more exposure for him. And he has a very interesting story to tell. But first, let's meet the man. Um, J can we call you JV or uh, how would you like to be? <laughs> JV? Um, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. So, my first question usually for tabletop nerds is how did you first know you were a geek, a nerd, one of us, but you're a very special kind of, of nerd geek. How, how did you first know that you wanted to enter the world of, of writing a fiction, which, you know, of course, and our follow-up questions is usually what we call the date, gateway drug for playing D&D and stuff like that. But how did you first know that you wanted to get into the world of, shall we say, make-believe? Make-believe. Probably in school when uh, I got picked on a lot. And a lot of my friends were the nerds, the geeks. So uh, I was kind of on the fringe of even that group of folks. But uh, I've been mo mostly a loner my whole life. And uh, that's kind of how I got into the make-believe world. Because since I couldn't, you know, be a part of that in crowd or whatever, then I would just create my own in crowd. Mm -hmm. Was there... Mm -hmm. A defining moment for you or like a gateway drug we talk about a certain book that you read or a video game or something there's usually something that somebody gets really attached to um outside your social circle and personal circumstances was there a book um, an author a teacher you know something in those early years while you were deciding well, you were one of us one of us that really inspired you oh sure no i read a lot of the the great novelists uh I was particularly fond of uh, ernest hemingway Mm -hmm. uh, like the old uh, you know, Charles Dickens novels and uh, read uh, Mark Twain, people like that. As I got into high school, I, you know, some of my high school teachers were always putting the, the classics for us to read. I don't think they do that so much anymore in schools. It sounds really. like they're coming to get you. <laughs> you told me you, you live you here. You live downtown in a major metropolis. Um, so, how, how long have you been writing? How long have you been a writer? My whole life. I think ever since I've been able to write, since I've been able to hold a pencil, I think I've been writing. I was writing journals like everybody, you know, when they were kids, and I started writing novels probably in middle school. Of course, they weren't very well organized novels, and I wrote them <laughs> in a in a notebook. But uh, when I was in high school, I think I might have written about three or four novels inside of a composition book in high school. I remember an English teacher in my high school that, that uh, struck me with something that I, to this day, found very profound. Uh, it was an English writing class that I had joined. And everyone knows my spelling, my grammar, my use of the English language is absolutely terrible. Um, <laughs> but everyone was always impressed by my imagination and pure gall at my ideas. And the English teacher told the class... Uh, we were talking about writing and he says, if you write every day and it's not a, you know, oh, this is the discipline. I'm an English teacher and you, you know, crack the whip. You're all going to be writers. And, you know, if you write every day, you must write a page a day and you sit there staring at a page. He says, if you wake up and you want to write and you find yourself with pen in hand doing it or playing around with it or wanting to it, he says, then you're a writer simple as that doesn't matter what you write if you write for yourself if you write for your family if you get published if you're putting pen to paper you know before because we had computers kind of back then um you know if that's what you just get up wanting to do and if you think about it that's if it dominates your thoughts in the day guess what guys you're a writer and it really struck me as profound because i had i wanted to create something but i was terrible at you know my brain going too fast for the page kind of thing so until i found something like this to unleash creativity um 
it uh, it was a uphill climb for me. Did you find that, uh, like I said, you were writing since day one? You were in high school. You mentioned you know you had books down. What became of this writing? Did was it something for yourself? I mean, even um, even Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, was part of this gentleman's club, and they all wrote novelitia. And they looked at what he was writing, and they thought, "What are you doing, dude?" And he's like, "I write for myself." He was actually quoted on this. He's like, "I don't write for you. I'm part of this writing club, but I don't write for you. I don't write for the public." He says, "I write for myself, and I want to shape this story." And now, years later, you know, he's he's a household name in the fantasy world. So let's dial back to young Torres. Were you writing funny. for yourself? Were you part of a gentleman's club? It's funny, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. I think I wrote for both. I wrote for myself. And then I wrote to prove to others that I could do it. And I know when I was in high school, it was one of the few things that I could do where the teachers really were impressed with. I mean, they, I've had many teachers tell me growing up, you know, that I had a knack for writing. Mm -hmm. And when I, I think I was just got out of high school, I started writing letters to the editor of the Miami Herald and they would actually publish them. And that was a real thrill for me, you know. Um, it wasn't until I was in my first year in college, uh, I was encouraged by... Uh, one of the counselors who's a uh, Mexican American like me. And so like, you know, when you're in a Mexican American community that just doesn't, there wasn't always a lot of uh, uh, encouragement <laughs> academically. Yeah. I'm just gonna leave it there. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, but, that's fine. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying so hard not to mention one of my, um, you know, uh, American idols, uh, Cheech Marin, who I absolutely <laughs> adore. Brilliant man. <laughs> But I want to mention him for the right reason, not the wrong reasons. <laughs> so, right. So no, no, she was this, this woman. She was incredible, and she was she was really trying to get me to do, to harness this ability that I had. She goes, you know, there's this big essay contest. You'll get a scholarship for the college, and blah blah blah. You you get to have lunch with the mayor of Miami and all this other stuff. And I'm like, okay, you know, well, I got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. So I entered this this essay contest. You know, I had something to do with humanities, and I actually won this thing. Oh wow! And yeah, I represented the college and uh, I had lunch with the mayor and they gave me this scholarship to continue my studies. And that's when I knew. That's when I really knew that uh, that I could really turn this into something. But I had I've always felt like uh, I just didn't have enough experience in life to to produce anything that I think would people would want to read. So here I am in my 40s. And I think I think the time is right. Yeah. A lot of people say write what you know. You know, and and. Uh, I, uh, I recently came across uh, talking with other DMs about DM tips. And mm -hmm. this is something that personally I would never, even though I've DM for over 30 years, I would never really approach the, this is how I think you should DM, blah, 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 blah. Because uh, truth is truth. And then there's your experience. And for a writer, um, you could write what you know, or I'm assuming, not really being a writer, I hope I'm not talking above my creative pay, pay grade to you here, sir. Um, writing how you see the world if that makes sense, you know, yeah. the, the, through the child's eye type of thing. You've been writing since you were a young teen um, in grade school and now standing beside the mayor and going, let's do lunch, you know. Yeah. Oh, what a great yeah. moment for you as well as all of, you know, that's really cool. Um, now you're in your 40s, like myself, and you yeah. are writing your own content. And this is why we want to talk to you today. Let me just throw up now talking about putting up a red flag i i like this flag uh <laughs> but i'm canadian and i don't suffer from um the american sensitivity of what one does with one's american flag and we're looking at a picture of a revamp of the american flag with the blue in the left corner but instead of stars it has a white crown and mm. you have the red and white stripes and i think this is a very creative idea of of what you're trying to sell because the idea of your book is what if America, after a certain war and time period, had reverted into a monarchy as opposed to continued on like with the current day? It's an alternate America. Now, alternate Americas are huge in yeah. video game. In the video game industry, the broken down of America, the steampunk America, the alternate, you know, we never got this energy source. We followed that energy source, which changed our world America. They're very huge. They're very big. Um, so I'd like to present J.V. Torres to the world through our show that the man has a creative vision and a very, very cool fiction look of an alternate America. And he has a book and it's a podcast and it's an audio book and we are plugging it today. And can you tell us the title of the series, sir? 
Sure. Um, it's called The Rise of King Asylus. And what King Asylus is, is uh, basically a, a soldier who rises to the rank of general. And during America's Second Civil War, which happens when the states fracture because they want to secede from the United States for ideological reasons or whatever, um, really turns out to be a, a very intricate plot that was uh, initiated by foreign interests. And so uh, the last president of the United States tells, gives uh, Silas all this power to kind of try to reunify the country. Mm. But um, as you start to delve into the story, you realize that Silas and the president and all these people are all in cahoots together. They're all part of this um, secret society, if you will, this Illuminati type group of people. And so they've decided, you know what, we're going to do away with uh, politics. This is this is becoming too chaotic with, you know, a two party system. We're just going to put um, we can't use a dictator because that's too unpopular. We'll make this glorified king figurehead king and we'll put him in power, reunify the country. And uh, he's our guy, basically, because he's one of us. Mm -hmm. So Silas becomes this, this leader, this king of America. And the first thing he does is, you know, he tells them, well, I can't I can't make all the changes you guys want until you give me absolute power. So they do that to give him absolute power. And the first thing he does is go after the very people who put him in there. And so this becomes a sets this chain reaction of Silas versus all the, the all of his former or all of his uh, former buddies in the in his Illuminati group. And so they try to kill him. And the, the entire first and second season of the show is all about him trying to get to them, them trying to get to him. And it's really a matter of who is the good guy or who's the bad guy. And I think uh, some of the debate that has happened on Twitter and Reddit and some other uh, sites that people who actually take the time to, you know, look and analyze this story to try to break down what's happening. Mm -hmm. They have a real difficult time deciding whether there is a good guy in the story. And I think there are some people, that, <laughs> I think some people side with the king because he says all the right things, but then he does all the, the evil things. So well, sh show me a, a politically correct spy movie or government movie where, you know, there's government shadow organizations that are doing the wrong thing, but even the organizations, the legal ones that are fixing it or whatever, have to step beyond the public eye and do some, shall we say, I wouldn't say immoral or amoral, but you know, get shit done for yeah. America. Let's get it done, you know. Um, yeah. Well, we don't want to. We don't want to dig into the plot uh, too much. Like we want to tease. We want to. We want to tell. We want to intrigue. I don't. I don't want you spilling the guts of the whole book here. I'm very tempted yeah. not to to quote a bunch of Star Wars with Jar Jar going. And we grant emergency powers to the Chancellor. And you've got. You know, King Asylus, I mean, <clears throat> Palpatine up there going, I love democracy and I will lay down this power, you know. But you've already told us that he's he's walking a line where he pulls, like, gets rid of former friends. I, I believe Hitler did that. As well as gets rid of Illuminati, which is a, a huge group of influence that could, you know, make him a puppet. And if they're gone, then he actually is calling the shots for good or ill. He is in control. It's not a puppet regime. Um, well, that, that's the, the one the, one of the great things about this story is that it, no matter how much you learn about the plot or the storyline, it always raises more questions than it answers. Ooh. And so then you're always left with how exactly is able is he able to pull this off? How is he able to do this? And so I, I kind of put the breadcrumbs along the trail so that people keep wanting more and more and more. And it's just kind of just become a really epic story. So let me ask you what um, as opposed to just um, writing a book. And, and putting it on, you know, like the proverbial bookshelf, trying to get it published. What made you make the decision to become a, what we call a content creator and make it an audio book and, and put it up as a podcast as well? Well, just for clarification, Jeff, the book isn't out yet and neither is the audio book. And the reason why I decided to do it essentially in reverse is because I've, I listened to a lot of different podcasts leading up to creating this a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And what I learned was that podcasters are able to uh, generate their own audience long before they ever released any purchasable content. Mm -hmm. so that was kind of the kind of the gist of this was that I wanted to present to people a story that had so much 
you know, uh, so much detail and, and so much curiosity that they would want to read the book because the book is, is essentially what you don't understand or what you miss from the story and the, and the podcast, not because it's not there, but because um, I don't really go into the details of it. The oh, gaps, okay. sorry, the gaps, sorry, my, are, my, my bad. Yeah. The gaps are in the novel. Yeah. And, and if you just read the novel and you're like, Hey, this is a great novel, but I have questions about this and this, those things are in the podcast. Yeah. So they, they are parallel to each other in storyline only on the, on the timeline of things and on the main details. But, um, all the, like the, the, the characters reactions and the characters backstories mm -hmm. and well, you know, what happened between when, when, uh, the King did this and the King did that, there's this gap. So all of that is in the novel. Oh yeah. No, it's like you're releasing the Harry Potter movies and then the books for like the deep, explanation you know you can get away with the podcast the story is there we're not talking about yeah. a bunch of trailers you're not talking about your hype you know i've listened to a couple of them and there's story there and like you said it, it raises questions and then the release date of your book is when well uh as we were as you sent me this message this morning to to do this i was actually uh finishing up some of the final chapters in in the, in the i'm in the final edit stages so i'm looking sometime late August, early September. It no, should be out before. Almost as if we planned it that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, hey, you know, it, it, we don't want to end a podcast with you holding up a book going, oh, by the way, and buy my book. We're talking yeah, about yeah. an idea. The man has a podcast out there. You got to listen to it. It's definitely original or we wouldn't put it under our banner. Uh, it falls into that wonderful alt fiction America that's so popular these days. And if you're interested, the book's coming out. You should check it out. So, um, you're, but all joking aside, Endgame, you know, is the book. Where can they find it? Where could you yeah. actually purchase our, you know, like the audio book copy or the actual hardcover? Well, uh, I know we're going to run everything through Amazon, okay. um, but everything will, everything will be, will be able to be found on our website, which is the rise of King .com. And maybe you can put that somewhere on the, yeah, no, no, def definitely. And like, uh, I'm, we people look yeah. through, the scroll the credits, the music we use, you know, who everybody is, uh, links that answer questions going, well, we're, you know, because we don't just flash it on the screen. Buy now. You know, the Shamway <laughs> deal is ending soon. Taurus is in his late 40s. He doesn't have longer for this earth. He's all up in his head. Um, but uh, getting back to the show, um, what made, what was, was there a specific inspiration to choose this type of fiction to, that got you into an alternate American history? I think, well, you know, I'd be, I'd be lying if I said the current political climate uh, didn't have something to do with it. Uh, mm. Clearly, I think the world is changing politically. Um, I don't know where it's going. I don't think anybody does. But I, I definitely like to, to play in this fantasy that, well, if it did go this route, maybe this would happen. And if, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things that are happening in the story that are part of what I truly think. And then there's some that's just completely, that's just out there in left field. Uh, for example, there's a real paranormal uh, co component to the story, you know, where the King actually has these arguments with Satan, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Illuminati is one step away, right? It's gonna... He's literally arguing with the devil. And, and this is, this is, to me, is just, those are probably the most fun things for me to do because I play both characters. I play the devil and I play his life. So when I when I when I do those when I work those those, those that dialogue that, that that exchange between those two, it's a tremendous amount of fun for me. It shouldn't be, but it is. And um, so you know, because I'm I'm devout Catholic and. <laughs> No, but you're, you're talking about a, a story device where a man is facing uh, a looming ultimate dark power. It's either it could be a reflection of himself, you know, yeah. it could be talking dark mirror. It could be something that no matter how powerful he is, there's something in your story element that is more powerful, you know, that could bring him down. It's, there's no, I can see that there's a lot you could do with it. There's a really good scene and I cannot remember the name of the movie, but Will Smith is under a bridge. And one of his agents screws up and the guy walks like real London cobblestone 
brick mortar <laughs> brick bridge you know and it, this this arcing tunnel just goes on and the guy goes in there and there's will smith and he gets up on this little stage like a judge smacks the hammer and starts talking to the guy walking him through what mission he just did what he screwed up how he's going to adjudicate it and you're wondering what's going on and then smith starts raising his voice and this shadow starts going up the wall as he as the actor gets angry and you're like holy crap he's talking to the devil <laughs> right? and then he tones it down and gives the guy proper crap and off you go and don't screw up again or else you know served right and just the idea of something nasty under a bridge away from the public eye the shadow looming and just one actor going on and on this back and forth and there is a dialogue with him sure. and the other actor but like you said your main character gets into an argument or something with the devil or whatever there's like you know 100 ways to paint it um i brought this up to talk about like beyond the religious aspect is a it's a plot device people it will reflect something that taurus is you know is digging in about such a powerful character and supernatural spin on things to stays is is a little bit more lighthearted. is geeky it's not as serious as you know as a lot of a lot of people are taking this day um so have you got anything else in the works i mean we're here obviously to talk about your up and coming book the rise of king of silas and you've been writing for such a long time have you got any other projects going well actually oh uh, well just one what has to do with the story and then I'll, I'll tell you about the other one sure. and that is there's a short film that we're doing about the rise of king of silence and it's called the ordo oh, cool. and it's it ha it's a little window into that secret society of theirs it's called the ordo and uh and that is uh something we worked on since the spring and it's you know when you work with actors and the directors kind of uh he's got a million other projects going on so it's kind of slow we were hoping to have it out by now but Probably as the book is coming out, that short movie is going to come out. It's about 10 minutes long. Okay. Um, but the other the other book that I'm working on is something called Transforming Man. And it's about this uh, really, really heavy set person, a uh, beast person who wakes up one day and uh, decides he's going to lose weight. And without giving too much away, what he ends up doing is he, he finds this uh, really simple elliptical machine and this really uh, odd vague book and he starts reading this book and he starts doing these 10 15 minute workouts and within a matter of a couple of weeks he literally transforms into this you know fabio really buff <laughs> <laughs> and so he shows up at his sister's birthday party and, and everybody there was wondering who this guy was and he's like i'm, I'm your brother she goes you're, you're my brother and so everybody's really like blown away by who is how did you do this like this is incredible like you were like this really big dude and now you're like this really chiseled out of stone statue dude right <laughs> well he starts talking about you know you gotta you gotta tell us what your what your um what your secret is so he's this got picked up by uh one of the local news people and so they showed a before and after photograph right and so he's telling the people what, about what he was doing and so that got picked up by a national uh, media. And so they were running the story. They were trying to figure out how this guy was able to transform himself in such a short amount of time. And before he knew it, he had become extremely uh, popular. And he was famous. He became like a, he went viral. Mm -hmm. And so um, they were trying to get him to talk more about this in one of these Ellen type shows. And he's like, well, you know, he's telling him about the elliptical machine. He's telling him about this. This book, she goes, but there's got to be something else. That's that's too simple. It, it just can't be that. What book are you reading? So he tells him the title of this book, and the, and like, and she's looking around. It's like, well, has anybody heard about this book? And so then they try to investigate who, who what this book is that he was reading, and it turns out this book didn't exist. And so they start to call him a fraud. And so he falls from grace, right, in the sense that, you know, uh, here he was, and he had everybody hanging on his every word and then all of a sudden they were questioning how he was able to do it but it didn't change the fact that he had actually changed himself physically and so um that's where i'm going to stop right now yeah <laughs> full of credibility. this is where the book is really good right this, so this is where that story is going no, yeah. the next question would be um social media content outlets where can we find you now obviously since we've picked up your feed you can find us you can find the rise of king alice on our youtube channel Rom Alice, Rom who's Alice? Sorry, I'm ranking Asylus. Sorry, 
<laughs> Told you, <laughs> English not my <laughs> spot. Okay, I, I'm so bad with this. Alice, that's the first. That's yeah, the first. They're like, you want to do a talk show, but you barely speak English, but it's the only language I almost know. Um, All right, go ahead. On our YouTube channel, uh, the Rollmongers Podcasting Network, uh, but our main go-to is a podcast, and we've picked up JV Taurus's feed, and you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Speaker, Stitcher, uh, the list goes on. Podcaster, we are everywhere. Podbean, to, and look much. for the rise of King of Silas. But if you want to go to the source, I believe we can also find you where, sir. Um, well, we're actually at kingofsilas.buzzsprout.com. Mm -hmm. That's the direct a direct link to the host of the show, where, who's hosting the show. Mm -hmm. uh, but our main go-to is iTunes always. Um, the rise of King of Silas .com. Uh, Radio Public is our other uh, big pusher. Spotify is now, another one. Off the air, we were joking about trading T-shirts and propping each other up. But is like, did you have merchandise in the works or as of yet? We do. We, do. we have stuff on T Public, and it, that also, that also can be found on our website. Um, yeah. If you're on Twitter, look us up at King of Silas. Uh, we're always posting stuff about some. Actually, we're giving stuff away this summer. So Jeff, you can be looking for something in your mailbox soon. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. I'm sure. You you drink I, I, coffee? I, yeah, my wife does. You don't drink coffee? I, I drink tea, no. I tea. Uh, Maybe it's my half British, one quarter Scottish side through the family or whatever, but I, um, <laughs> I'm i a tea I'm a tea granny. The wife lives on, on Canadian Tim Hortons coffee. Um, well, I tell you what, I'll send you a t-shirt if you wear it on one of your shows. Are you kidding me? I'll be wearing that a lot. <laughs> I'll be wearing that a lot just because, like, hey, if, yeah. J, if JV Taurus, you know, wants to... Well... Now, since we're talking about marketing, I'll tell you about like this idea I had. I don't know if anyone's going to believe me, but um, for uh, budgeting, budgeting, um, <clears throat> blossoming podcasters out there, okay, I have yeah. found an absolute free host called Anchor.fm. Whole bunch of techno guardian, but technically, I haven't looked at them too much, but technically, you could just give them stuff and they put it up for free. So that's zero dollars. And for mm -hmm. someone who's low budget, that's great. Now, I myself started off uh, whispered to me by someone I know, um, SoundCloud. Okay, that's a hundred. Yeah. And if you could pay 16 a month or I pay $140 Canadian a year for them to host my feed. But that's one little core of the market. Then we pay Spreaker, 35 bucks a month. And Spreaker taps into Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and a bunch more, as well as makes a video for our YouTube as an audio file and sends it there. So I really like Spreaker. And also we pay $117 Canadian to Podbean a year. Now, most people be like, what are you doing? That's nuts. Why would you just, just pick a host and go? Now, we also have our own website now, uh, rollmongers.com, where <clears throat> we'll embed one of those feeds. But our idea was um, instead of trying to compete for a single large audience, Let's hit every audience. And now we're even starting to, to live stream raw on Twitch, which wasn't like we preferred a polished product with ambient music and everything and like heavily edited and stuff. So yeah, like a really good radio show podcast as opposed to just the it's happening raw. But we are trying to approach the Twitch market as well. Um, it occurred to me that someone like yourself, who is doing very well with his own website and his own feed, could tag team with us or maybe someone that just starting out a podcast that has decent audio, please that um, has some sort of fictional or RPG content and something that we could approve, could enter our Patreon at $5 tier. Now this is, think about this, this is 60 bucks Canadian or American a year. That's half of what you'd pay for a single feed, unless you wanna go with Anchor, it's free. And you would instantly tap into our large listenership, all of our hosts, and thank you JV Taurus for taking the chance. The guy has no reason to support. To, you know to become one of our patrons but he has and for his 60 dollars a year we are singing his praises singing far and wide or whatever uh I've and why well it I'm helps, it helps us pay the bills it helps okay. us pay the bills sure you know um but we're doing a bunch of this stuff for networking purposes we've interviewed on attack of opportunity several people um that are uh, notable names as well as people that no one knows them at all and we don't care we looked at their content and went there's something about this content that we like, that we enjoy, that we want to share, that we want to help, right? Sure. We didn't just look at their followers or whatever. Now, I'm not going to lie. We recently interviewed um, some notable people uh, and we're just thrilled, you know, to just to have them on the show. Sure. Um, but we've also looked into people that are just starting out 
but there's something about the website there's something about you know the way they presented themselves and it's like that's good content and we want to you know reach behind give them a sling and catapult them forward and we know some of these podcasters are going to do far better than our network but we're just happy to be a part of it getting to know each other getting the networking when i've spoke with you we spoke two hours <laughs> the first yeah. day just yeah. kind of like hey, my, wife, kind of thing. my wife was giving me these looks like who are you talking, who are you to? talking to some crazy canadian guy <laughs> don't tell him where we live honey you know that type of thing um no I, we feel the same way i feel the same way I'm, jeff there's you no know, we're, we're gonna we're gonna which you know we're gonna do what we can when the season kicks in in, in october we, we're kicking everything off for the third season and and uh on halloween we're actually having um we're gonna have a big um premiere party here in Baltimore and I'm inviting a bunch of people that are cast members and a lot of people who are fans of the show that come to that private event that we're going to have. We're going to try to stream it on mm -hmm. Facebook or Twitter or maybe both um, just to kind of give people, you know, hey, you know, this is a lot bigger than you think. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are into this show and we want to, you know, share that with some of the other people that we do, that we collaborate with, like your show, for example. Yeah. So. If you have any literature, if you have any stickers or any cards or anything you want me to put out at these events where we go to, we'll be more than happy to do that. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Because um, like you said, you don't get anywhere unless you help the guy beside you or help like help the community. <laughs> I've had some great help from um, Connor Besh from Clinton's Core Classics, who used to be under a banner and went his own way, from uh, Reeton, from ReetonEntertainment.com, who has a podcast about video games, also appeared beside us on the show and has gone off with their own, un away from our banner, but their own show. Um, from Michael Kasevin, Dead Aussie Gamer. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting and working a short time with Guy Scalander, a great GM. I recently met David Fry. And like I said, I'm not building this going, this is my street cred, look at all these famous people I know. I'm talking about big or small people in the co community are a lot friendlier than you'd think. And if you approach them the right way, of course, I always approach them very the wrong way, horrible texting and messaging, just, hey, can, can I want to talk to you? Um, you'd find very open with opinions, with help, with, with advice, you know, sure. about what they're doing with their projects, about maybe they could help you, whatever, you know, on Facebook, on um, on Messenger, certain systems. Um, Cody Lewis has a great Facebook page called the IRA and he talks about independent uh, role play association and GMs and content creator stuff. They share ideas. It's not really a place to go, hey, here's my latest podcast episode. They share ideas and they go, what do you think about this? And they're talking at the DM level or they're talking about the production level or they're talking about even at the player level type of thing. And there's a lot of Facebook pages like that. You should look for them where there's just a dialogue running and great advice, great ideas to share. You know, there's a lot out here in the community, guys, just besides being a consumer where you just click on the next link that looks good, click on the next guy that looks funny, click on the next guy, you know, dig into the dialogue. There's so much yeah. to learn and so and so much, you know, you can, so far you can get yourself if you wanna be a content creator, um, as well as, you know, learn from the greats, as it were, they're really friendly people. It's all in how you approach them. Don't do approach them the way I have. I <laughs> blew it right out of the gate. Too much spamming, too much, you know, gushing over people that I got so excited just to talk to. Um, but I want to thank our guest today, JV Torres, for being on the show, for talking about his book, which is a podcast at the moment. But if you really want more than just the bare bones, you want to want more about this guy, his actual physical book and audiobook will be released soon. The Rise of King Asylus, which you can find with us and at riseofkingasylus.com. JV, thank you so, so much for being on the show today, Give us, giving you. us your time. And we'll, we'll have your people call my people. We'll trade some T-shirts and we'll see what, uh, you know, what cross-marketing what does because it's fun. You got to do this for fun, you know. One last question, though. Do you have, yes, sir. you have small children? Do I have, sorry? You have small children. No. Uh, my daughter, I have, my stepdaughter is married with three kids. Uh, my daughter just, my daughter got married, is off to Japan with a cast member. She married G. Tamlin. Are there and any we, small children in your orbit? Uh, <laughs> oh, my son's going off to college this year. So, uh, um, I'm saying, I have a children's book that's oh, out. Oh, you know what? Um, a friend, uh, one of our cast members, uh, Ashley Florence, has a young son. And when I was five or six for Christmas, my granddad, 
uh, who's British, built an actual chalkboard, like from hand with wood, one for me, one for my older brother. And we came out this Christmas and there are these chalkboards that are, you know, X big, wrote on them, flipped them over. I've had this thing forever and kept it in the house waiting for someone. And they just came over to visit with the young lad who's about six or seven now. And we gifted it to him. And to see a kid who was spent five, 20 minutes on mom's phone playing some kind of candy crunch to actually physically interact, which was something that was made old school, you know, was yeah. just heartwarming. And yeah. it's like, do you like this? You know, do you want, did you want to, you know, did you want to take this home type of thing? My grandfather made this and he's like, uh huh. You know, and then Ashley comes downstairs and goes, you have one of those. <laughs> it was like, oh, you're smart kid you, you know totally just lit up for me oh i'd love to have your grandfather's easel well i'll give it to you and you know through a friend that has a kid that was worthy and then the, ashley comes down she's like you got one of these oh it was different thank god and he's still gonna get it but um <clears throat> sorry if i think hard about it the, i have friends and cast members and such that um that we will get your book to I'll send one your way you yep. can look at it yeah, Tell me what de definitely, definitely. Now, th this little guy actually wants to be a YouTuber, so you might see him. His first little <laughs> YouTube channel would be like, you know, plugging your book. Yeah, that'd be cool. That would be good, you know. And it's fun. It's fun. Like everyone's like, that's so cold. It's marketing, and you're just in it for the money. It's like, no, we're doing this because we love this. You people have no idea how much costs up front. You know, you have to give up golfing and beer. And video yeah, games so you want to do it. this you know the money people spend on golfing alcohol and a bunch of stuff a year translates into like well that budget is gone and i will invest you know these hundreds of dollars a couple of grand um just to do this it's so much fun i love doing this i'm exhausted but i'm having a time in my life up to my some eyeballs in debt into a corvette some people put all their money into all yeah like of... like restoring a car you know and people your neighbors are walking by going that's never gonna run it's like who cares <laughs> i i love my chevrolet arcadia and i'm going to restore it to its natural miniature form you know like they're, they're like okay should have went with the mustang <laughs> nah. anyway thanks for being on the show sir and we will see you next time on attack thank you thank you have of opportunity one.